Hey, it's Deacon John. This is Talk Gnosis. I'm joined by Jason. Hi, Jason. Hello. And we've got Robert Guffey on to talk about his book, Operation Mind Poop Poop, uh, as well <laughs> as <laughs> Operation Mindfuck, as well as uh, some of his past work, some of his uh, articles and stuff that intertwines uh, and intercessions with uh, Gnosticism. I think it's going to be a very interesting uh, conversation. I always open up the show. I, I need uh, I need uh, a better brain and mouth, Jason. Uh, but it is going to be really <laughs> interesting. It's, it's going to be wide ranging. Uh, we actually have done a, a lot of programming on this show about conspiracy culture, about conspiracy theories. Uh, in the ways that they they do sometimes are interestingly connected to to Gnosticism. So I think we're going to have a, a great job with Robert uh, about that. But before we get to that, first we have patreon.com slash Gnostic. You can help us continue to do the show for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. You could also put a cap on that. So, you know, you could give as little as a dollar per month. You can also do one-time donations at paypal.me slash Gnostic. You can also help us out by telling people about the show, liking and subscribing uh by the way we're on both youtube and the podcatcher of your choice you, you do help us uh, get noticed if you leave comments leave ratings and subscribe on those platforms however you'd like to take in the show and if you want to listen to us instead of watch us hey fire us up on your portable device and if you're uh, sick of these disembodied voices we are on youtube uh so yeah check us out there okay uh robert Let's start with what is QAnon? And again, I know I, I sometimes we open these shows up with enormous questions. So, so I guess uh, this is uh, we're looking for the elevator pitch or as, as good as a description that you can give us because I know that QAnon is actually a very complex phenomenon. But, but what is QAnon? And, and really what I'm going to find the most interesting, what, what drew you to write about it? What fascinated you about this, this phenomenon? Uh, it's interesting. I have a friend who lives up in uh, Seattle, and her sister was uh, visiting her the other day. And um, my friend had had a copy of my book there of Operation Mindfuck sitting there. And her sister said, "Well, what's this book about?" And she said, "Well, you know, it's about QAnon." And then her sister said, "Well, what's what's that?" You know, and and her sister <laughs> wasn't um, someone who was unaware of. Uh, politics or uh, current events, you know. So even someone who's plugged in, uh, even after January 6th, there are people who have no idea. They've never heard of QAnon. They know nothing about it. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously QAnon, it purports to be uh, a... Um, uh, it's... Uh, a conspiracy theory, I guess you could say, which is sort of uh, a shorthand, because um, we could get into that later. But is it is it even really a conspiracy theory? But it's a conspiracy theory that states that uh, Democrats and liberals are actually really like Freemason Satanists who are kidnapping children and taking them uh, into underground bases and uh, plucking the adrenochrome uh, out of them and then using the adrenochrome to um, uh, stay immortal, uh, basically, and a lot of Hollywood actors and, uh, and politicians are involved in this vast conspiracy. Uh, ultimately, what it really is was is sort of the 21st century version of Creep, the committee to reelect the president uh, that Nixon uh, uh, used the E. Howard Hunt and G. Gordon Liddy to do his dirty tricks for him in the 70s, and they actually had a, a, an actual organization called Creep, uh, C. R. E. <laughs> committee to re-elect the president and E. Howard Hunt and G. Gordon Liddy running around the country um, performing a panoply of illegal and unconstitutional acts like breaking into the office of Daniel El Ellsberg, psychiatrist, uh, putting uh, LSD on the steering wheel of Jack Anderson, the <laughs> famous investigative reporter, so that he would hallucinate and like drive off a bridge. Uh, of course, Anderson was writing a series of uh, critical essays about Nixon. Uh, so anyone who was in Nixon's crosshairs uh, became in the crosshairs of, of the committee to reelect the president. And uh, QAnon is sort of a uh, less direct version of that. You know, instead of putting steering uh, LSD on a reporter's steering wheel, it, it operates through social media. 
uh, and that's the that's the Operation Mindfuck aspect of it. The title, of course, comes from uh, Robert Anton Wilson and Robert Shea wrote a book called The Illuminatus Trilogy uh, back in the 70s. And even before that, uh, Robert Anton Wilson and his friends and the Discorian Society uh, created this term, Operation Mindfuck. And the idea was to take what the John Birch Society and the ultra far right were doing with their own conspiracy theories. Uh, it, was, it was really the John Birch Society in the 50s and 60s that revived the entire notion of the Illuminati and, uh, and all of that. And they decided to uh, accuse you know, any progressive or Democrat of actually being part of the Illuminati. Uh, and Robert Anton Wilson saw this and thought, well, why don't we hijack that and we'll flip it? Uh, and thus was born Operation Mindfuck. And so he thought, well, we'll accuse them of being in the Illuminati. Uh, and uh, Robert Anton Wilson often used his position as the uh, letters editor. Uh, he was the editor of the letters section of Playboy. So he could publish whatever letters he wanted. So his friends would send in letters and they would publish them. <laughs> using you know, Henry Kissinger being a member of the Illuminati. Or, and, but what's great about Robert Anton Wilson and what distinguishes him from QAnon is that he actually had the sense of humor to accuse himself of being in the Illuminati. You know, they would publish letters. Robert Anton Wilson you know, is secretly a member of the Illuminati. Can't you see this? Uh, which uh, gives it a kind of puckish uh, quality you know, that uh, uh, QAnon often lacks and particularly uh, QAnon's acolytes uh, seem to have a, a distinct lack of uh, a sense of humor. I wrote a book <laughs> in 2017. It was a novel called Until the Last Dog Dies. Uh, and the whole book, the idea of it was that there's a pandemic uh, that goes around the globe. Uh, it's a virus. Uh, it doesn't kill you, but it just um, affects the sense of humor centers of the brain. So <laughs> not fatal it just takes your sense of humor away and the whole novel is told from the point of view of this young stand-up comedian in LA and halfway through the book he comes down with the humor virus so slowly the humor sort of leaks out of the book and uh, I, I have wow. a friend uh, uh, Craig uh, Gidney who's also a writer he wrote a book called A Spectral View just recently he, he uh, emailed me soon after the lockdown and said until, uh, until the last dog dies was seeming to be more and more pressing it. Uh, and then after I got into the weeds with QAnon, I thought, oh, maybe it really is prescient uh, in the sense that I would read these QAnon posts where they're talking about adrenochrome, which comes directly from Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Uh, the, the whole idea uh, comes from <laughs> the scene in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas where uh, Dr. Gonzo and Raul Duke are talking in the hotel room and Dr. Gonzo, who's an attorney, uh, says, you know, I represented the Satanist freak and he didn't have enough money to pay me. So he paid me in this adrenochrome, uh, which is this chemical that you have to extract from a living human person. Uh, and then when you ingest it, it gives you, it takes you higher than you've ever been before. Uh, and uh, I, I think I've actually successfully um, pinpointed where Hunter S. Thompson got the idea for the adrenochrome scene in Karen Lillian, Las Vegas, because if you read his collected letters, he keeps a, a consistent list of all the books he's reading uh, in his early 20s. And he mentions reading uh, Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. So I think we can assume that he also read Brave New World Revisited, which is the follow-up collection of nonfiction essays that Huxley wrote in 1958, where he's analyzing, well, how far did the world go to what I predicted back in the 30s when I wrote Brave New World? And there's a section in there where he starts talking about adrenochrome. Now, ad adrenochrome is actually a chemical that's produced in the brain. It's not a, a recreational drug, you know, but he starts describing it in such a way where I imagine a young Hunter S. Thompson reading it and thinking, oh, this would be a great idea. Like you know, the, the idea that you could use this as a recreational drug. And I think he filed that away in his brain. And then later when he's writing Fair and Loathing in Las Vegas, it came out in that scene. And of course, the whole scene is intended to be humorous, but you read in all these QAnon posts, they're writing about it uh, with utter seriousness. There's no sense that when they quote from it, that there's any humor in it at all. Like they don't even recognize that it's supposed to be funny. And I see that over and over again, the QAnon thing. 
Marjorie Taylor Greene, the uh, QAnon Republican candidate, uh, she was recently uh, incensed at Jimmy Kimmel for making a joke and uh, 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 threatened to sue him over the joke. And I thought, oh, there's another uh, humor virus proof. Uh, and then there's a guy named Rick Renee. Uh, there's a guy named Rick Renee who I write about extensively in Operation Mindfuck. He has this QAnon podcast called The Blessed to Teach Show. Uh, and uh, there were just recently he was doing an episode where he um, played this clip of uh, Fred Armisen, the comedian from Saturday Night mm -hmm. Live in mm -hmm. Portlandia. There's this episode of uh, Parks and Recreation, the sitcom, where Fred Armisen plays this like foreign dignitary who comes to the little town and, and he does this whole monologue where he's talking about what happens in his country. Like if, 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 you, if you cook the fish wrong, they send you to jail. Uh, if, if you do this, you know, if you did the laundry wrong, they send you to jail. And, and it's this whole like over the top thing where he's clearly doing this bit. Uh, but Rick Renee actually played it and said that this was footage from Australia. Uh, <laughs> and what was happening because of the QAnon, uh, because of the, of the lockdown, because of COVID-19. And, and, and you have Fred Armisen. Uh, he plays the clip and Fred Armisen is dressed in this kind of like military gear talking about, you know, you do this, you go to jail. You do this, you go to jail. Uh, and and he then it goes back to Rick Renee and he's like shaking his head and his face is like enraged. He's like, how long are you going to come up, keep uh, you know, putting up with this kind of thing? Um, and I just like, <laughs> you know, I, I just wonder, blah, 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 blah. You, you, you can't uh, believe it uh, at, at, at a certain point. Uh, but uh, so... QAnon, it props up originally in October, November 2017 on 4chan. Uh, someone named Q starts posting these messages saying that they have an in with the White House and um, uh, the, uh, Donald Trump can't trust his the intelligence agencies anymore, the CIA, etc. So he's uh, working with these former intelligence agents and current intelligence agents to to drain the swamp and to combat the quote deep state. And uh, I was aware of Q when it first popped up, but I wasn't really paying much attention to it. It didn't seem worth my time, uh, quite frankly. Uh, and so I didn't really start paying attention to it until it was March of uh, 2020, just after the lockdown. And I was talking to an old friend of mine, and he's in his late 50s and lives in the Midwest. And I started talking about how hard it was, you know, transitioning to teaching English composition and creative writing classes on Zoom. Uh, and we were just chatting about that. And then suddenly he starts talking about how COVID-19 is going to be a positive development in 2020. And, uh, and then he said that, you know, when Trump is re-elected. Uh, he was going to bring free energy to the whole country. He was going to uh, abolish the income tax, uh, that there were military troops cleaning out all these covert military tunnels, uh, saving these children who have been uh, kidnapped by the, the black hats, uh, i.e. the Illuminati. And uh, I thought, thought, what the hell is he talking about? Because uh, <laughs> this person wasn't I, I didn't. I hadn't communicated him in a while, but I didn't think of him as a person who was like easily gold. Uh, and uh, so I said, "Well, why don't you send me? Where, where are you getting this from? You know, can you send me the links?" So finally, he sends me these links to these QAnon posts and the videos, and I immediately detected something that I don't think would be obvious to anyone who hadn't been um, intimately familiar with conspiracy theories for for three decades, uh, and that is that uh, most of the elements that make up the QAnon mythos uh, have already um, been around in the conspiracy world for a long time, that they would clearly been pilfered from, from these previous sources, um, some of them going back to the late 1800s. Uh, and, and the most fascinating pattern that I notice is that um, they, and when I say they, I mean uh, Team Q, because it, it was clear to me from the beginning that, that 
QAnon wasn't just one person. And just 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 teaching literature and creative writing, you you uh, look a lot at someone's people's writing styles, and it was clear to me that it was more than just one person posting all this. So uh, a Q would take a, a conspiracy theory, the original content of which was essentially anti-fascist in nature. It doesn't matter for the purpose of this discussion if the conspiracy theory was was true or not. Uh, just that it's clear that the message of it was anti-fascist. Uh, and then Q would flip it. And so now it was pro-fascist, pro-conservative, pro-martial law, and ultimately pro-Trump, uh, and took something, conspiracy theory, which is sort of inherently counter-cultural, and, and, and flipped it around so that now it was clearly this, this propagandistic message the ultimate punchline of which was vote for Trump. Um, and, and I don't understand why, like my, in, in terms of my friend, if, if a conspiracy theory had popped up back in the late eighties, say, or, or the early nineties, and the purpose of the conspiracy theory always led you to the punchline vote for Bush, he would have been immediately, Oh, so I'm that suspicious. Uh, <laughs> yeah. but for some reason in this case, that 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 uh, natural skepticism was not there, not just with him, but with a lot of other people. And uh, uh, so, just as taking a specific example, um, I, I immediately noticed that a lot of the QAnon stuff drew upon uh, a book called Operation Vampire Killer 2000, which originally <laughs> appeared back in the early 90s, and uh, I ordered away for a copy probably in 1993, maybe. Uh, and uh, because of the title, you know, I, I had to get a book called Operation Vampire Killer 2000, written by a bunch <laughs> of cops. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it was this guy named Jack McClam, who was this former uh, police officer in Arizona. And they, he had formed a group called Police Against the New World Order. Uh, and what, what I found fascinating about it was that these were a bunch of uh, libertarians, but they weren't pro-Republican. Um, the the one of the main purposes of the of this pamphlet, this like saddle stitched booklet, uh, was to warn people about uh, factions of the government using a fake crisis to declare martial law, uh, and and um, really warning about the increasing militarization of the police. This was something that they were they were not for uh and so these guys they were libertarians who were opposed to militarizing the police they were opposed to to fascism and they were opposed to the republican party uh, and and they were constantly you know and this is the seeds of the militia movement uh and they were they were constantly warning people about imminent martial law um and you know all the christian patriots are going to be rounded up and sent to these concentration camps. People like Linda Thompson, uh, who was an attorney who did a documentary called Waco, the Big Lie. Uh, she went around the uh, Christian Patriot circuit uh, in the early 90s with this documentary about Waco, the Big Lie, where uh, she would she would warn about these concentration camps, show videos of the, of the chain link fences uh, facing inward rather than outward. Uh, saying, well, these things, they say that they're you know, military bases, but they're not. They're concentration camps, and they're there, uh, and they're going to they're gonna declare martial law and throw everyone into it. And, uh, and within a few years, these libertarians kind of morphed into the militia movement. Uh, and so for decades, they've been crazy concerned about, um, about martial law and the secret concentration camps. And then, but then suddenly, in October of 2017, when Trump was at his lowest approval ratings ever, uh, Q suddenly appears and begins posting messages and photographs on 4chan that, that seem to indicate that this person has access to the White House. Uh, and, and within weeks, the same group of people who had been so concerned about secret concentration camps, suddenly they spun around 180 degrees and decided, no, uh, actually martial law is a good thing. And, and why? Well, because Q told them 
uh, it would, it's the damn liberals that are going to be thrown into the concentration camps, not the right wing Christians. And so, oh, well, now it's OK then. Um, and, I, and, and I thought when I first sent away for that Operation Vampire Killer pamphlet back in the early 90s, what, what struck me about it, what I found fascinating about it was I saw this overlap in terms of, uh, even though these were hard right libertarians, they were, they seemed genuinely concerned about the increasing militarization of the police. So in that sense, there was, there was an overlap. There was a possibility of uh, building a bridge between these people and, and progressives who are also concerned about the same thing. So there was like a shared goal there. I thought, isn't that interesting? Uh, I mean, maybe there would be a, a way of opening up a dialogue between these two groups. But of course, it quickly, you know, devolved into, you know, Oklahoma City bombing and and, and people being concerned about blue helmeted UN troops uh, invading the United States and, and, you know, people like Mark Cornkey, who was the head of the Michigan militia, uh, who was actually a custodian at the local university, uh, you know, warning about imminent invasions of black helicopters and things like that. Um, so I thought it was fascinating that you could convince thousands of people to reverse these very deeply held convictions in a matter of weeks, uh, just because of some anonymous post uh, on 4chan. I thought that's, that's incredible. I mean, that is, that is an amazing sociological experiment. And, and I'm sure they look at it as a behavioral and sociological experiment that was that was very uh, successful. Um, and in the book, I, I go into the idea that that QAnon was from the beginning meant to be a kind of a plan B or, or plan Q, uh, if you will. <laughs> uh, it looks like Trump isn't going to win the election. We're going to activate plan B. Uh, and, and that directly leads to, to January 6th. And, and I think that that was the plan all along. Uh, I was recently, a few months ago, listening to a podcast called The Farm uh, that's hosted by Steve Snyder. And uh, he was interviewing a guy named James Scaminacci, who has a military uh, intelligence background. Uh, and, he, and he was saying how when he was watching January 6 unfold on the TV, it seemed clear to him that the that the MAGA people and the QAnon people uh, were were the cover for the real attack. And uh, I don't have a military intelligence background, but that seemed clear to me <laughs> as it was unfolding. That same thought came to me. Uh, it, you know, most of the people who went there on January 6 weren't intending to commit violence, uh, but they had all been primed by all these Q-tubers, uh, which I'd been monitoring all the way up to January 6th. And I could hear how incendiary uh, the, the rhetoric was getting. Uh, and I knew it was going to culminate in some sort of firework display, but I, I didn't know when. I didn't know if it was January 6th, January 20th, you know, who knows. Uh, but I, uh, I suspect that most of them went there <clears throat> not really intending to commit violence, but then you had the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers. So QAnon is kind of like the uh, the the um, Joseph Goebbels Department of Propaganda. <laughs> and then you have the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers are kind of like the SS and the brown shirts, you know? And, and so you had the guys with the zip ties and the camo fatigues with cameras mounted on their chest and they're there for a specific purpose and all these other QAnon and MAGA people are there just getting uh, riled up uh, and under the cover of all this chaos the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers were to, to go in and you know trust up Pelosi uh, maybe take hostages they got these cameras mounted on their chest were they going to live stream you know this hostage situation until uh, the real president, you know, um, is, is, is allowed to, uh, retake, uh, power, uh, you know, and it was only really a series of odd coincidences and synchronicities that prevented that day from being much bloodier and more violent than it was. At one point, there was just one security guard who was between a group of these guys 
and the unlocked doors that led directly into the chambers. And the security guard just managed to lead them away uh, while Pelosi and Mike Pence and all these guys got away. Uh, so really, it's just a series of synchronicities that prevented it from being more serious. Um, uh, just to and, so, yeah. sorry, just to, to dive in just for a quick second here is that I think I it's it's also valid to call QAnon uh, the 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 like the envelope of QAnon as a series of synchronicities, um, like not to like I think that there there's been uh, like a certain amount of manufacture there, but then there's also been I think a sense of play with what from what I've been hearing as well what other people are finding, and I think this is why I'm so interested about. A lot of what you've been talking about, like I, I, sorry, you've been you've been throwing so many ideas at me. I need to express some uh, just a little bit of a response. Is that like, is that uh, like for for the for the original posters and for those who continue to kind of encourage and develop on on this thing, that it's it hasn't been like um like a fully fledged document that started everything, as, as much as it's been like, even as their community go and discover something else they will then factor that in. Like it's sort of this like evolving narrative, like a dungeon master following along with what the, with players are giving them in a D and D game, you know? Um, uh, and it's that, it's that sort of almost playful nature and that sense of like, of the, um, that series of things in which like, I, uh, yeah, sorry. I'm, I think I'm just kind of jump, just j jumping into that. When you said synchronicities, that sounded so so connected to the entire process of QAnon. All, all that makes perfect sense. It's I would say it's programmed synchronicity. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's manipulating synchronicity uh, to your, to your own end, to propagandistic ends. It's, mm -hmm. um, people have talked about QAnon as a LARP, and yeah. we can, you can trace that that idea back. Uh, and I mentioned this in the book to uh, Richard Shaver, uh, Richard Shaver, who uh, Richard Shaver and Ray Palmer. Ray Palmer was the editor of Amazing Stories Science Fiction Magazine back in the 1940s. And uh, Richard Shaver was this fellow who claimed that he had been down into the subterranean realms and there were this warring race of Daros and Taros, and detrimental robots. There was the good robots and the, and, the, and the evil robots and the evil robots were stealing, kidnapping human beings and dragging them under the earth and torturing them um, sadistically uh, and, and uh, sexually abusing them as well in a series of very bizarre and creative ways. Uh, and this was became a sensation in Amazing Stories in the 1940s, much to the horror of uh, tried and true science fiction fans who tried their best, who were for the most part rationalists and and try, try to eject Richard Shaver from uh, the, the pages of Amazing Stories magazine. But it was much too popular a phenomenon. And, 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 it, and it kept going for about a period of 10 years. And what was the interesting thing about it is that, that you could call that the first LARP in the sense that a lot of readers engaged with it. Uh, they would go out spelunking, spelunking expeditions to find the secret caves that led into the Daros territories they would write letters saying that they went down there and they encountered the daros and got into like a laser battle fight uh with them there there's a guy named fred chrisman f-r-e-d fred chrisman c-r-i-s-m-a-n uh who who's kind of like um one of these early uh mysterious characters with intelligence connections who shows up not only in the richard Shaver story but also in the Maury Island UFO story and in the JFK assassination. So it's one of these guys who like, flits in and out of all these weird, weird stories. But Fred Chrisman got himself involved in the Shaver mystery claim that he had found some of these uh, secret tunnels. So readers would write in and then Ray Palmer would take these letters, which appeared to be proofs, and then publish those letters. And then Richard Shaver and Ray Palmer would take some of those details and put them back into... <laughs> Into the into the ever expanding narrative, and then mm. it's this confirmation bias uh, thing happens. You know where uh, the people reading are, are are reading their own additions to the mythology and thinking that it's proof. Um, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Not realizing that they're 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 co-creating, they're co-writing the the narrative. 
which like I think even saying narrative there is interesting to me too because like I think how you pointed out that like one of these core pieces of QAnon the the adrenochrome harvesting is like a thing that comes from like from uh, pretty clearly or like uh, th there's a strong case to make that it comes from fear and loathing and that from fear and loathing it comes from Brave New World Revisited is that like that the it's it, how how much of this is the power of story and narrative over like evidence and documentation, if that makes sense. Like, um, oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, a, that, a good that's story. Not... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's the genius of it. Uh, you know, any any good propaganda has to tell a good story. Um, and and I think it's interesting. That's another thing that fascinated me about it. Not only was it taking these these older conspiracy theories and flipping them. Uh, turning them from anti-fascist into pro into pro-fascist narratives, but it also drawing upon uh, pop culture uh, in the terms of fictional narratives, like uh, horror stories. H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, who also mm -hmm. wrote about other gods and subterranean realms, you know, or or um, B movies. You know, there's there's a film from 1960 called The Leech Woman. Uh, it's a black and white <laughs> universal movie, and it's all about this expedition uh, of uh, uh, expedition of white people who go into the Africa, you know, and they find this tribe who uh, will extract fluid from the pineal gland from a living human being, and then they extract the fluid, and then the leech woman will drink it, and she will uh, regain her youth. Uh, but she, unfortunately, you have to keep doing this uh, on a regular basis. So throughout the movie, she has to keep finding someone else to and kill them and extract the pineal gland from the back of their neck, and then she drinks it. You know, uh, and then that that whole <laughs> idea goes back to uh, there's a a play called The Man in Half Moon Street from the 30s, which had mm. essentially the same idea, except it was set in you know modern day 1930s London or New York or whatever, and uh, there was this you know, uh, elite doctor who had figured this out and he's going around killing people, extracting their pineal gland. It was even made into a film, The Man Half Moon Street uh, in mm. the 30s. And then later remade by Hammer Hammer Horror Pictures as uh, the man who could cheat death with, uh, I think, Christopher Lee or Peter Cushing, or maybe both are, are in that film. Uh, so there's this, uh, you know, pulling in elements of, of Pulp Fiction uh into the whole thing as well which is also which is also fascinating because the whole narrative really draws upon a kind of pulp fiction or or comic book kind of um yeah mentality. yeah, yeah. It, it's like the same the same type of mentality that can remember all the details of the dc universe uh you know uh totally yeah you know what, uh, what the x-men do in issue 10 and they can remember it Mm -hmm. QAnon draws upon that kind of file cabinet kind of memory in order mm -hmm. to keep track of it all. Uh, and also the whole black hat, white hat thing. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. it's right out of a, a superhero comic book. So it's fascinating that whoever the architects were, you know, looked at what's popular today. Okay, like there's an entire generation of people raised on Marvel comics turned into film. Uh, how do you take that kind of uh, good versus evil structure and apply it to this propagandistic narrative well and there's there's a uh it, it, it almost makes me like interested to take a challenge of taking something that's contemporary that popular and popular that people know is a major piece of fiction and sort of squint and say how could you turn this into proof of something or like the the emergent myth of something 60 years later like could you turn twilight into the 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 next conspiracy narrative if that makes sense like it's almost like an interesting writing exercise <laughs> well right well there are there are vampire churches uh you know vampire true cult, enough, you know, <laughs> true enough. Osborne, bram stoker and yeah and, and and all that and and in fact you could take it even further back to the protocols of the elders of zion mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. began as a fictional narrative it actually began as a satire uh, that was not initially anti-Semitic. Uh, and then later the Nazis took this fictional narrative and turned it into uh, what they wanted you to believe was an actual 
minutes of a, of a document of a meeting of the protocols of the elders of Zion and then turned it into a, an anti-Semitic uh, propagandistic document. There's um, that um, there's that anti uh, anti humor virus again. Well, yes, exactly. Yeah, they yes, they took satire and they made it literal. Yeah, um, there, yeah there's there's also another example of that more recent than uh, protocols is there's there was a book published in the 60s called uh, the report on Iron Mountain, uh, supposedly edited by Leonard Lewin. And uh, Leonard Lewin later said that he actually wrote it. He didn't edit it, but it's but it appears to be, you know, it's presented to you as if it's the real minutes of a of the a meeting of this, of this group uh, of U.S. military um, experts talking about the future of the military industrial complex and how they were going to have to go through these stages of of first faking terrorism, and then eventually it culminates in the faking of an alien invasion. Uh, and l years later, Leonard Lewis said, you know, I, I wrote it as a satire uh, of, you know, how far the, the military industrial complex would go to, to maintain itself, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what, what's funny about that is uh, I later saw an interview with L. Fletcher Prouty, who wrote The Secret Team, and uh, is, was the basis for the Donald Sutherland character in Oliver Stone's JFK. He's the Mr. X sitting mm -hmm. on the bed telling Kevin Costner about the, you know, the, the, the facts behind the conspiracy against the JFK assassination. And, and uh, L. Fletcher Prouty said that when he read it, he thought it was real uh, because he said when he was working in the JFK administration, he said all the young guys working in the administration were saying these things. So I thought <laughs> it had to be true. And he later met Leonard Lewin and told him that. And I thought that that's great because just mm. because something is a satire doesn't necessarily mean it's not true. But it was written it was written as a as a fictional narrative, presented as a nonfiction narrative. And here you have this guy who actually was in the JFK administration reading it and thinking this must be true. I heard people saying this. Mm. Uh, uh, I've I've often also wondered if uh, Alan Moore, who gave me a blurb for Operation Pinefuck, <laughs> but Alan Moore who wrote Watchmen and Beef for Vendetta. Uh, I, I, I've often wondered if he read Report on Iron Mountain because Watchmen, the graphic novel, it, it, ultimately it's a conspiracy by the character Os Osmandius to, to fake an alien invasion in order to bring about the end of the Cold War and, and a kind of utopian world. Uh, uh, and so I, I, I've often wondered if Alan Moore maybe drew upon the report on, on Iron Mountain. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Robert. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jason. Actually, I was just about to say, uh, I feel like I've dominated the con my side of the conversation. John, do you want to ask some Gnostic questions? <laughs> yeah. Well, before getting into to Gnosticism per se, I, I guess I just need to start with, Robert, if you see anything religious about QAnon, and it's all right if you don't, but do you see it as a religious phenomenon or at least somehow replacing or answering people's religious urges and needs? Well, I, in the book, I, I call it a, a secular religion. Uh, in, in the sense that it's it's as if someone figured out, okay, uh, you know, with, with George W. Bush, we figured out how to um, activate this evangelical Christian base. Uh, and, and it's as if someone said, well, why, why stop there? Uh, you know, we have them. How do we get them and plus, plus those people? Uh, and so QAnon constructs its narrative in such a way that there are a lot of Christian nationalists and, you know, so-called Christian patriots who are super into it. But then there are also people who would never describe themselves that way. Because I, I, I know, like, former Democrats who went right down the QAnon rabbit hole. Uh, people who are going to vote for Bernie Sanders going over <laughs> and, and, and going totally into QAnon. Uh, accelerationists are into QAnon, mm. uh, fans of the paranormal who, who may not be religious or describe themselves that way, or uh, conspiracy theorists or people who are into the occult, uh, they, they might think, uh, oh, well, yeah, there are these people who are the Illuminati 
and they're sacrificing kids, but there are no real demons involved. You know, maybe maybe they think they are, but they aren't really there. So you could be an atheist and be into QAnon. It's this it's this buffet, and you can pluck and choose these elements that resonate with you. Uh, so in that sense, it's that's the participatory aspect of it. You can just ignore those parts you don't like <laughs> and focus on the parts that you do like. Uh, but at base, it, it does have a, a a definite religious center about it in the sense it, it's almost, it's like theosophy or something, you know, like a secret chief. There's Q mm -hmm. as the secret chief and you're, and you're communicating with the secret chief and you don't know much about the secret chief, but he knows all about you and, and he can come in out of the ether and contact you at any moment, you know, um, and make you feel special in that way. Uh, but, and also requiring the unerring faith in the secret chief too, like the secret chief can do no wrong. Even when the secret chief is lying, uh, that's actually all part of the plan. That's a very religious, um, uh, structure. Um, and there's even, there was something called, I mentioned this in the book, they make a kingdom ministry. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they were, um, there was a fellow named Mark Andre Argentino and he published an article on conversation.com and he talked about how, uh, he says, I've been studying the growth of the QAnon movement as part of my research into how extremist religious and political organizations create propaganda and recruit new members to ideological causes. So he logged into Zoom uh, and attended the first public service of what is essentially a QAnon church called wow. the Omega Kingdom Ministry. And he spent 12 <laughs> weeks attending the two hour Sunday morning service. And he said what they would do is they would uh, um, present the latest Q posts and then interpret them through the Bible. Oh no. <laughs> and he says uh, the the Sunday service is led by Russ Wagner, leader of the Indiana-based OKM, and Kevin Bushy, a retired colonel, running for election to the main House of Representatives. A lot of military people involved in the QAnon thing, by the way. Hmm. A lot of cops. A lot of cops too. Uh, the service begins with an opening prayer from Wagner that he says will protect the Zoom room from Satan. This is followed by an hour-long <laughs> Bible study where Wagner might explain the fall cabal video, that's the kind of QAnon video, that attendees had just watched or offer his observations on socio-political events from the previous week. Everything is explained through the lens of the Bible and QAnon narratives. Bush, he then does 45 minutes of decoding items that have appeared recently on the app called QMAP that is used to share conspiracy theories. The last 15 minutes are dedicated to communion and prayer. Um, and wow. the Omega, Omega wow. Kingdom history, they're still, they're still going strong. So. Yeah, there's a definite, uh, definite religious component to it. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, that this is much, much more than metaphor, or much more than uh, than a simile, or or comparing two things, uh, particularly with that example, which I had no idea about, and even more terrified and mind uh, caved in from QAnon, hearing about the the official church that goes along with it. And of course, th oh, there boy. won't be schisms in that church, and new churches, and uh, oh, new yes, QAnon yes. religions popping up, and, uh, and and what have you. So, uh, Robert, we're, we're obviously, uh, the, both Jason and I consider ourselves modern Gnostics. Uh, we're quite fond of, of Gnosticism, but I think there's an idea or perhaps what people want to see on the show is the idea that, that any Gnostic idea, if you take an idea out of Gnosticism, it's, it's inherently um, going to give you liberation. It's inherently an idea that, that is good and good for people. But, you know, I, I would contend sometimes I, I, I really want to flesh out ideas I have about quote unquote good Gnosticism and quote unquote bad Gnosticism. I say I want to flesh those out because right now good Gnosticism is whatever I like and bad Gnosticism <laughs> is whatever I don't. So I think oh, I need uh, right. better standards than that. But that said, well, you know, I, I, uh, oh, go ahead. one quick thing there, Jonathan, is that I, uh, the, because I've thought a lot about this too, is that I think like what is useful Gnosticism and what is dangerous Gnosticism? Uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's 
That's good. That's good. So yeah. I, I think you can see where, where I'm going with this, Robert, which is, do you, do you see any, any Gnostic themes or Gnostic ideas in QAnon? Uh, and of course, you know, I, I, I think I do, but I wish they weren't there. But, but I think, you know, ideas can be taken out of the larger system and be used for, for Ill, Ill means. But uh, let me know if you see anything there. Yeah, I like I like the the useful or non useful as opposed to good bad. It takes the I guess the judgment out of it or the the, the moralism yeah. uh, out of it. Um, uh, but yes, I mean there I, I mentioned this in the book. There is a kind of odd kind of distorted Gnostic uh, element to QAnon, just in, in the sense of um, the idea that the reality we see is not the reality that's actually there, that uh, objective reality is actually an illusion. Uh, and the whole point of QAnon is the great awakening. That's a phrase that's used. Mm. The great awakening is the moment where this illusion is lifted. Uh, and they even, the QAnon people, <laughs> and it's really weird to hear these like uh, evangelical Christians using this phrase, but they call themselves red-pilled Christians, uh, taking wow. the 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 symbolism from the matrix so and 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 the the irony of these evangelical christians drawing upon the science fiction metaphor created by two transgender women and then you know uh uh not no no sense of irony about that they they on one hand will push this real uh virulent homophobia um and transphobia while also at the same time drawing upon this film <laughs> created by two transgender women. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and they'll talk about the following the white rabbit, which they're, they're referring to the matrix. They're, it's like, they're not even aware that it comes from Alice in Wonderland originally, mm -hmm. uh, which by the way, is also filled chalk filled the original Alice in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll is chalk filled with Kabbalistic, uh, symbolism. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and so then, then the Wachowski brothers use the same symbolism in the Matrix, which is obviously there's a lot of Gnostic symbolism in the Matrix. And now here, these Christian patriots come along, and uh, they're using the Matrix as their main metaphorical framework for 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 QAnon and calling themselves red pilled Christians. And of course, the irony is they're actually blue pilled. They actually took the blue pill, mm -hmm. but they think they took the red pill. So it makes it even more uh, ironic. And so yeah. the whole the sense of, of the, quote, the deep state uh, that, that Donald Trump talks about and that QAnon pushes uh, is a kind of oddly Gnostic metaphor. I mean, the, the idea is that the deep state, it's like a false front, you know, Hollywood Western town, right? There's what mm -hmm. you think you see, and then there's the reality behind it. And so in the book, I talk about, well, is that really an appropriate uh, metaphor? Uh, and and I, I, I offered the replacement metaphor of uh, instead of deep state, which clearly comes from Peter Dale Scott wrote a book called Deep Politics about the JFK assassination in the early 90s. And Peter Dale Scott being a you know, tenured professor at Berkeley, he couldn't just come out and say I'm writing about a conspiracy theory. Uh, you know, so what, what can I call it instead? Deep politics, right? Uh, and then later on, that term is used and then morphs into the deep state. Uh, but I, in, in, in Operation Mindfuck, I say a better metaphor might be, rather than the deep state, the satellite government, in the sense that the deep state implies that everything is, is, is hidden. Uh, there's absolutely no way to access this hidden reality. Um, it's just too deeply buried. Uh, you can't see it. Whereas it, it, it seems to me that these, these government conspiracies <laughs> that, do, that do occur uh, very often happen out right in front of everybody. Uh, it's like mm -hmm. the prolonged letter by Edgar Allan Poe. It's sitting there, the letter is sitting there right on the, the shelf and no one's seeing it. And so I offered the metaphor of the satellite government because it's really, you have Washington, D.C., then you have these multinational corporations that orbit around Washington, D.C., these satellites, and the satellites are influencing uh, the, the government, but it's not, it's like a corporation like SAIC, which I write about in my book, Camellio. SAIC is a, a corporation that has a website. People work there. You can look it up. You can find out who the CEO is, who's on the board of directors. They're not a secret cabal. 
but but they are influencing policy and doing unconstitutional things. <laughs> you know, you know so that, they're not hiding. Uh, one of the things, and this actually kind of leads into maybe a, a question or an, an offer and, uh, to, to discuss as well, is but it, you mentioned Alan Moore. Um, I remember he, he has a quote uh, of something he said after he'd researched the CIA for one of his books, um, is that um, uh, there is no grand conspiracy. There is no, like, um, uh, secret cabal of, of a single group that's, like, taking care of everything. What there are, there are a lot of conspiracies filled with people who make tons of mistakes like they're they're bumbling clowns in a way um uh and they're all bumping into each other and they're all making mistakes but that that like the 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 real terror and the reason we would rather believe there is a real plan and the reason we manufacture these stories that make us feel like there's a there's a someone's got a plan is because it's actually so much scarier to think that reality is rudderless Right, and and the, the book that Alan Moore was referring to that he was researching is a great uh, graphic novel called mm -hmm. Brought to Light, and the Brought to Light was actually uh, funded by the Christic Institute uh, yeah, yeah. That, that was investigating the Iran Contra affair, and there were two stories in it. One was by Joyce Brabner, um, who was the wife of Harvey Picar, who did the comic book American Splendor, mm -hmm. and. And the other half was by Alan Moore and Bill Sienkiewicz. And it was this kind of um, psychedelic, uh, um, phantasmagoric interpretation of the facts as, as uncovered by the Christic Institute about the Iran-Contra affair. So it begins with a bald eagle, this drunken bald eagle sitting at a bar <laughs> like in Florida somewhere. And he's, he's popping off at the guy, you're, you're the viewer. And you're sitting next to the bald eagle, and the bald eagle says, "Come, come, sit next to me. I got a story to tell you." And then the drunken bald eagle just starts boasting about all the horrible shit that he's been involved in for the past few decades. Uh, and and Bill Sienkiewicz paints it in this wonderful, um, distorted Ralph Steadman esque painterly style. Uh, it's actually quite brilliant. Uh, I think it's been out of print for years. Uh, somebody should really uh, bring it back into print. Uh, and Alan Moore, yes. So while investigating all that, because I think the Christic Institute gave him a bunch of their documents in order to to write this narrative, uh, uh, he came to the conclusion that no, there's not one monolithic conspiracy. There's all these little conspiracies all vying against each other. And it that that reminded me of um, uh, I heard Timothy Leary talking about when he was thrown into prison, and of course Leary started out as a tenured Harvard professor and then had, you know, the most epic of midlife crises uh, and became the LSD Pied Piper of the 60s and eventually is thrown into Folsom. Uh, and and he's there in, in this prison. And, and one detail I love about the story is that when Leary was working at Harvard, he developed a psychological profile to be given to prisoners. And so when he's, he, when he's inducted into the prison, they give him his own test. Uh, <laughs> And so he said he's out there in the rec yard and he's looking at all these gangs that run the prison. And he suddenly realizes that the prison is run in exactly the same way as the psychology department at Harvard. Uh, the, that the, the same gangs that ran Harvard are the same gangs that run the prison. It's just, they're just different, different faces, <laughs> different mm -hmm. uh, coming from a diff different economic class uh uh different racial profiles but essentially the same kind of machiavellian uh you know backstabbing kind of moves to gain control mm -hmm. and, and and if ever, if you've ever spent any time in academia you you'll know that that's true uh you know <laughs> you think wow well, you know somebody actually went to this degree to become like co-chair of the English department, if they're willing to do that to become co-chair, then you know what would the president do to maintain power? Well, and uh, and this is kind of the thing about like that notion of all these conspiracies bumping into each other too is that it's like any like as, as you get these like aggregates of groups of people that are in like that turn into a l much larger group. Yeah, it's it's like nothing but Machiavellian politics of various groups, sort of like. Yeah, like go kart bumping into each other, um, or like uh, pinball, you know. Um, which, 
that's what Robert Anton Wilson said was that if, if there was one monolithic conspiracy controlling everything, the world would make sense. Since the world doesn't make sense, we can only assume that there are a bunch of different conspiracies all bumping up against each other. That's that's what causes the chaos. And I'm I'm gonna leap in on that is that the the making sense. I think this is kind of what to me feels like the impulse of QAnon and the impulse of some of the what I would say less useful forms of Gnosticism is that it's a it's a it's a wrapper around which you can then choose to make things make sense. Um but then you just stop there. You know what I mean? Like I've, okay, I found this narrative. Everything makes sense now. Uh, that's it. Like, right. Uh, and of course, th th and, and what's hilarious is that it doesn't make sense. No. <laughs> <laughs> as, as I, as I point out in the book and in, in part three of the book, uh, the, 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 the book initially is composed of, you know, initially I wrote a five part series for Salon then the Evergreen Review asked me to do a kind of overview of the Trump administration. So I wrote a very long piece called Donald Trump's Operation Mindfuck that was published by the Evergreen Review at the beginning of November of 2020, just before the election. And, and then I guess that got enough attention that Dale Peck, the editor, said, would you do a follow up? Like, where does QAnon go from here post-election? And at first, my initial reaction was, oh, my God, I don't want to have to like wallow around in the QAnon mud in order to write that. But then like a second later, I thought this is a wonderful opportunity to document the collapse of an entire belief system in, in real time. And, hmm. and, and so I, in part three, and of course it doesn't collapse, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. it just keeps going. but, but the, the point was to, to document every time they say X on one of these QAnon podcasts and then X doesn't happen, how do they deal with it? And at first you see them trying to explain it. Like it would reach January 20th and they would say, well, this is why the military didn't go in and pull Biden out of the White House. This is why it didn't happen. Then as it goes on further and there were more dates and more predictions as to what is supposed to occur and it doesn't happen, they just give up uh, trying to explain it. it you would just reach that date and then they would pretend like they never said it. Uh, <laughs> there's no mention mm -hmm. of it. You know, Like, oh, well, I thought on March 4th, it was all supposed to revert. You know what happened? I thought Nasara was supposed to be enacted, and then the and 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 Hillary and everyone was supposed to go to Gitmo. What happened? They just they don't even mention it. They don't even attempt to explain it. Uh, and they just keep they just keep moving forward. And there's a wonderful part in the in the book where I mentioned that uh, Rick Renee soon after the election he has this podcast where it's almost like back to the basics. It's like he's trying to introduce everything to new viewers perhaps uh and he talks about q uh having to lie that yes some of the posts were lies because he had to lie he had to put out the disinformation in order to confuse the white hat uh, the black hats so 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 at that point i i i, I talk about how i was at the egyptian theater uh in la back in like 2003 and it was like the 60th anniversary of the egyptian theater and they had a uh, a midnight seance because supposedly it's a very old theater on, on hollywood boulevard and and it's supposedly haunted so they brought in an actual like psychic uh a medium i should say to come in and try to contact the ghosts that are in the egyptian theater so here we are hollywood boulevard egyptian theater midnight and there's this medium and he's talking about the various spirits that he's contacted in the past. And he mentions having contacted uh, Faye Ray. Uh, and <laughs> and I, I, I turned to my friend, and keep in mind, this is 2003. I turned to my friend and I said, isn't Faye Ray st still alive? And I re had remembered <laughs> seeing her at the Academy Awards uh, the previous year because uh, there was this interaction between her and Billy Crystal and Billy Crystal, like didn't know who she was. Um, and, and I thought, yeah, I hadn't heard that she died, you know, and then and this guy didn't, he didn't realize that this is, it's the Egyptian theater. It's midnight in LA. The only people who would be there would be, you know, movie fanatics. So you hear a guy in the back row go, Fay Ray is still alive. And then someone up in the balcony is like, oh yeah, Fay Ray is still alive. She's my neighbor. Uh, and then someone else, oh yeah, Fay Ray's going to speak at the theater next month. Fay Ray's still alive. And then the medium goes, and it was beautiful. He put his like hands out in front of him, like Doctor Strange, uh, like warding off the 
the demons and and the medium goes oh he goes well what often happens is that the demons will pretend to be other people <laughs> Uh, so it could be that one of these evil spirits was just pretending to be Fey Ray. Uh, and I thought that's an amazing save there. I thought that was like really quick thinking. And then a second later, I thought, well, that throws everything into question. Like, you may not be talking to Aunt Tilly. You might be talking to a demon who's pretending to be Aunt Tilly. So what's the point? <laughs> and so I, I, this is analogous to, to QAnon saying, well, sometimes Q has to lie. It's like, well, then why are you placing all of your faith into someone who has to lie? <laughs> why are you basing your most, you, you, I mean, people have thrown away family members because they were not believing what Q said, but now you're saying Q has to lie? So you're basing the most important decisions of your life, like whether or not to go to jail <laughs> for, for invading the Capitol. Uh, uh, you're basing these decisions on someone who has to lie? Well, and and it it really speaks to I think this power, the power that the narrative has, like over and above anything that that is trying to be truth. If that makes sense, like like uh, truth is whatever I need to believe right now for this story to still feel good for me. If that makes sense, right. like that's the like the, the, that's what it feels like is happening at a sort of psychological level. Like um, I just need to pivot. And the, the, this group needs to pivot so that I I don't stop getting the validation, you know? Right. Um, I there, there's a point in the book where I talk about the broadcast that they did right after. Um, it was in December of 2020, if you recall. Somebody, um, and and now it's like one of those things that went down the memory hole. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the guy who blew up the AT and T building in um, in in uh, Tennessee. Uh, uh, and, and it's normally, it would have been something that would have been in the, like in another, in a normal year, it would have covered the news cycle for like six months, you know, but instead it just disappeared like after two days. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and, uh, Rick's friend, Gene, uh, the anonymous Gene, who claims to have a series of contacts in the intelligence world, uh, it came on the air to say that what was really going on there was it was invo all involved with the uh, Dominion software and the explosion was an attempt by the black hats to explode the evidence that the white hats had collected to prove that the <laughs> Dominion software was responsible for Biden supposedly winning the election and that and that Trump was actually in the White House laughing at the attempts by the black hats to subvert his, uh, th you know, 5D chess game. Uh, <laughs> and and, and uh, in, in the Zoom room at the time, you could see all the people, most of them older white people uh, with American flags behind them. Uh, and, and they were like clapping, like clapping giddily at this information that Trump was actually laughing at the, at the black hats and that they were actually winning. And I, I appeared on a, when the Evergreen Review published the initial series of articles, I appeared on the Evergreen Review podcast and the host, Miracle Jones, said uh, that to him, it felt like um, like the lies that children tell themselves, like abandoned children uh, tell themselves to deal with the fact that their parents left them. Well, oh, you know, my mom and dad, are, they're actually off doing wonderful things somewhere you know they're they're cia agents or they're or something they, they had to leave me because they they actually have this more important thing to do you know they're saving the world or something um uh it's like that kind of like abandoned child syndrome almost mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the stories that the QAnon people have to tell themselves in order to keep the the narrative going and the narrative is still going i mean just just the other day in fact it was only a few days after um Operation Mindfuck was published, which was officially published July 6th. Then a few days later, Q popped up out of the woodwork and started posting again. And and I thought, well, you know, it'd be humorous to think that he was doing it to help promote Operation Mindfuck. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, it's pretty clear it was to combat the damning uh, uh, testimony of Cassie Hutchinson at the January 6th hearings. Uh, uh, and, and in fact, the whole content of the last Q post was 
questioning uh, Cassidy Hutchinson's, you know, trying to make you think that she was a, a, a deep fake plant or, or something, uh, because Donald Trump said he didn't know who she was, even though there's photos of them next to each other. And then he went on to say why you can't believe her, even though he said he didn't know anything about her. Uh, so it's interesting how the somebody obviously made a phone call and said we need to pull the queue out of the woodwork to to combat this. But yeah, the, the narrative, it, it, it keeps going. Yeah, that, that's actually a, a good lead into to my next question. Uh, possibly the probably the final question. We'll we'll have to start wrapping up. Though I, I did want the the audience to know that that you wrote mm -hmm. uh, an article, the uh, the Gnostic vision of, of William Boros, as well as uh, the suppressed teachings of Gnosticism, which is uh, an interview with uh, Stefan Heller. So I hope we can have you back on the show to to talk about those those two pieces. Uh, oh yeah, that, yeah. that's fine. Yeah, but this is this has been fascinating. This has been great. But I but I think uh, you just mentioned, you know, that they need us uh, to dig out uh, Q and dust them off, right? Because uh, there was uh, the Q was needed again. And you mentioned back at the top of the show, uh, you sort of mentioned that the Q does have a purpose. That it's it's not a random conspiracy theory. So I, I guess I'm really asking you for the conspiracy behind the conspiracy. Like, where exactly do you think Q anon comes from? Well, okay, I, I, I addressed this at one point. I, I also mentioned in the book that the main focus of the, the HBO documentary uh, about Q was, you know, who is Q? And that was a question that was of less interest to me. I mean, I, it's a valid question, but in terms of the focus of the book, I was more interested in why was this successful as opposed to who is it? Because it ultimately almost doesn't matter, you know, who they are specifically. Um, I, I, I think it's a group of, of people who were hired specifically to construct the narrative for propagandistic purposes. Uh, there's, we were talking earlier about the LARPing aspect of it and, and how it was sort of participatory. And that participatory aspect of it is necessary to create the rapport between Q, the propagandist, and the target audience. Uh, it, and What's ironic is I talk about a documentary that's essentially a QAnon recruitment video, though they never mention QAnon at any point during the documentary. It's called Out of Shadows, which which took the internet by storm around April of 2020, just after the lockdown. And there's one point where it purports to be a documentary about uh, Hollywood's inter, uh, intersection with uh, Hollywood being used as a propaganda organ of the United States government, which is actually a valid subject to talk about. I, I'm working on a book now called Hollywood Haunts the World, and there's a chapter in there that deals with that very topic. But about, you know, about eight minutes into the documentary, it goes off in the Twilight Zone, and at some point they, they start talking about Michael Aquino. Uh, and Michael Aquino, who of course was the head of the Temple of Set and got embroiled in the whole satanic panic of the 80s and was accused of running uh, child molestation uh, sex trafficking ring on the Presidio military base in San Francisco. He was found innocent of those charges in a court of law. Uh, but they they spend eight minutes talking about Aquino or, or even longer. And they talk about this paper that he wrote called Mind War, which most, most people probably would have come across in the pages of Behold a Pale Horse by William Cooper. Uh, and Michael Aquino was an actual um, expert in, in psychological warfare and propaganda. And he was asked by his superior, Paul Vallelay, uh, post-Vietnam, where do we go from here? Uh, how do we kind of re retrofit uh, our ideas about psychological warfare in this post-Vietnam era? And asked Aquino to write this paper. So Aquino writes it, and he says the main idea of the paper is that in the electronic age that we're moving into, um, we need to think about a psychological warfare in a different way. And you have to do it in such a way where the target feels as if they're making every decision on their own. You have to create a rapport between the, the propagandist and the target so that the target feels like they're coming to all these conclusions themselves. The, they, the documentary, which is very much from a evangelical point of view, at one point they showed the title page of Mind War, and it says by Paul Vallelay and Michael Aquino. 
they never mentioned the fact that Paul Valley is the one military guy who came out during the election, during 2020, during the campaign, and said that Q was real. Uh, and, and Paul Valley is not a, a minor figure in the military. He's a very highly respected uh, military figure coming out and saying Q is real. The information that Q is giving you is real. Donald Trump can't trust the intelligence agencies. And so he's relying on this secret group of uh, 500 former law enforcement, and former intelligence agencies and current intelligence agents. And Q is getting his information from them. Q is a real person. So, so the same person who co-wrote the Mind War paper by Michael Aquino, which they're getting all paranoid about and out of shadows, is the same guy who's coming out promoting Q. Then you begin to realize that the QAnon posts are written to order to what Aquino describes as what you have to do in order to create a rapport with the target. You make mm. them think that any of their conclusions themselves. That's why almost all the Q posts are written as questions. They're not statements. They're, for the most part, it's just asking questions. And then you have to come to the answer yourself. And I've heard over and over again QAnon people saying, oh, yeah, it's all about the research, man. I did the research uh, and I found out that it was right. Well, they went to Google and they Googled what Q said and then it led them back to Q's post uh, you know, or, or some other some other bit of information that had been put on the internet mm -hmm. by some QAnon adjacent person or organization. Uh, and so the, the act of, uh, of the way the QAnon posts were written as questions, it, it is, is a perfect um, example of the, of the mind war process that Aquino was talking about. Uh, so that's, and that's where you get the LARPing aspect too. That's the participatory part of it. That creates the rapport. So that's why you have all these people thinking they came to the conclusion themselves, but then um, there were a bunch of QAnon suicides post January 6th because all these people uh, were sleepwalking into the situation. And some of them came out looking like really dazed, like what just happened? <laughs> and, and, and some of them mm -hmm. uh, actually went home and committed suicide because they were suddenly facing jail time and they didn't even realize how it all happened. Uh, because once you get swept up into that group mind think uh, and, and you think you're making the decisions on your own, but actually you're, you're doing exactly what Q influenced you to do. Um, uh, that can, that, I bet that that's very disconcerting emerging from that kind of uh, <laughs> uh, hypnotic state, you know, and suddenly realizing what the hell, what the hell did I just do? Well, and this, uh, this yeah. actually feels very close to like what I feel like dangerous Gnosticism is, is like uh, dangerous Gnosticism in the form of like getting so focused on like the world is out to get me. Um, you know, there's, there's spirits that want to, to, to harm me, all of these things like that are so focused on the oppressive nature of the world versus actually experiencing gnosis, <laughs> um, that, that, it, yeah, like, I think it can kind of be the same, like, it, there's sort of a, a, a similar sense of a dazed, like, uh, uh, reaction in which you're now no longer participating in your life. You're now, you're now, uh, uh avoiding so many things in an unhealthy way. Um, right. Sorry, I yeah, just kind of like made a bridge there. Well, it's interesting, you know, Herman, Herman Melville was was very much aware of, of Gnosticism and he, he writes Moby Dick and he writes um, the um, uh, classic story. Um, um, <laughs> I remember in the subtitle, the story of Wall Street, uh, the um, I'm I'm blanking on the the title of the story. There's 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 Moby Dick Bartleby where, Bartleby Bartleby the Scrivener. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so you have two uh, sort of Nox, Gnostic texts there. There's there's Ahab, who is sort of the more anarchic uh, uh, reaction to a human being realizing that he's living in this il illusion. You know, I'm I'm gonna take God down uh, with me. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna punch out the sun. You know, uh, that's <laughs> like the anarchist like gnostic you know i'm just going to burn the whole fucking thing down uh and then and then you have bartleby the scrivener who's the exact opposite who becomes passive you know i just i prefer not to i prefer not to engage in anything um uh and, and that's kind of like that dangerous thing that you're talking about where you're not participating and becoming kind of like sleepwalker to the point of that you're not even actually 
actively participating in the world. It's almost like QAnon merges those two. <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. I'm going oh, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna to sleepwalk while also burning the thing down to the ground. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. uh, very, very interesting uh, viewing it from that perspective. It's like a hybrid version of those two strains. It, like it, it sort of, it allows for both. Like it, it kind of, it's, uh, uh, it's sort of feeding you whatever you're hungry for, if that makes sense. Well, in, in a way, I mean, the, certainly um, uh, a lot of the appeal of QAnon is that you can just sit there and be a, quote, digital warrior. That's the phrase that they use, which is essentially like co code for surveilling and stalking and trolling people online who, who you think, who you've decided is either a Satanist or a pedophile. Uh, Mark Evanier, the comic book uh, television writer, he commented the other day that the new definition of pedophile is just anyone who tries to prevent Donald Trump from doing everything he wants to do. Uh, so that's like the, that's the definition of pedophile has been broadened to that extent. Uh, uh, and, and so the, the whole digital soldier aspect of QAnon, in my mind, ties into another book I wrote called called Camellio, where I talk a lot about unconstitutional surveillance and harassment. Uh, and QAnon is almost, I see, an extension of that program, of that latter-day COINTELPRO kind of program, where you're creating snitches, you know, a nation of snitches and, and trolls and, and, and people watching each other in the panopticon. Uh, but at the moment, by the way, I'm staring at the screen here in uh, in, in uh, StreamYard, and there's a little blue box in front of me that says, "You're in the show. Everyone can see and hear you." It's almost an ominous like a threat. <laughs> um, but the QAnon <laughs> takes that kind of uh, the that um, unconstitutional surveillance and harassment kind of thing that COINTELPRO was doing back in the '60s, and just and gives it to the people. <laughs> We're going to let you do it. You know, uh, we're not going to go out and surveil and harass people. You do it and you're going to enjoy doing it and you're going to think it's, it was your idea in the first place. And so, you know, a lot of a lot of these people spend their time har harassing innocent people online, you know, or or in those cases where they decide to take the, the Captain Ahab route, actually go with their spear to Comet Ping Pong or their or their, you know, AR-15 and go mm -hmm. and, and and shoot up the place because someone, an anonymous source online, told them that the guy who owns the shop is a Satanist, you know, and then he gets there and he shoots up the floor, even though he was said he was there to save the children who are in the basement. So I'm going to shoot directly into the floor where the, where the basement supposedly is. You know, that's that's another aspect of the things that don't make sense. Uh, and uh, when they when they arrested him, he, he said, quote, uh, yeah, I think I got some of my intel wrong. "Quote unquote," which is, you know, the, the the understatement of the year award should be given to him. Uh, but wow. uh, the the and 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 you know the whole comet ping pong uh, aspect of it. It's like comet ping pong became Mordor in in Lord of the Rings. It's you know mm. the center of evil. Uh, and 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 how you could the whole idea of that the proof. Of that was supposedly that that cheese pizza and pizza was actually these code words that actual pedophiles were using and that this is something recognized by the FBI. It turns out that all that actually comes from 4chan. It, so that's another confirmation bias. Like that was planted on 4chan like years earlier, that idea of, of pizza equating with the children and being used as a code. That like all that actually started on 4chan in the first place. So then years later they took that and then wove it into the Pizzagate thing. So it's this whole self-generating uh, mythology. There's uh, and maybe this is I'm not uh, maybe Jonathan can help me figure out a way for us to to loop this down to a close and then um, and we can we'll just book you for another talk because we can keep going forever. Um, but uh, but I think there's something also. Uh, interesting here about, like, I think you, one thing you've talked about is the, like, um, going from, like, anti-fascism to, like, essentially a pro-fascist perspective is, I think there's also something, and, like, the deep state versus satellite state is, like, when you said that the pizza guy saw, like, he said, I, he, I got my intel wrong. So he's using this, like, military-esque language. And, yeah. uh, and, and you're, as you said, the strength of, like, the military and cop-based 
uh, uh, contingent of, of QAnon is like how there's this this sort of like sense of uh, wanting a, a sense of authority and like top down um, uh, command, but like at the same time ignoring or, or choosing to like step away from this idea of the government having that. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, I mean, that's sort of part of the schizophrenia of a lot of people mm. couldn't quite figure out, uh, particularly people who were watching TV on January 6th and had never heard of QAnon before. Uh, and you're watching these guys wearing Blue Lives Matter t-shirts and they're actively engaging in cops, uh, in, in, in physical you know, uh, confrontations with cops, <clears throat> uh, beating up cops, chasing cops up the stairs. Uh, how do you explain this? You, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and, and the fact is that once, if, if you're a cop, yeah, blue lives matter, unless you're seen to be either a demon in human form or you're <laughs> supporting, you know, a secret group of pedophiles, then it, the blue life doesn't matter anymore. You know, you, you don't have any value anymore because you've forsaken any kind of value. You're not even really human anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and there's a lot of articles. Mother Jones did an article about QAnon cops. Um, there was a recent um, dump of information in the latter half of last year where a lot of people were outed as being members of the Oath Keepers. And there was the sheriff of, of Riverside, uh, Riverside, California. The, the sheriff was outed in this dump as being a member of Oath Keepers. And he said, he said I didn't even remember joining. Uh, he said, and besides, you know, people say that they're extremists, they're not really extremists, you know, like he didn't remember joining, but he also had reasons why they're not really extremists. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, oddly enough, uh, there was even a guy who contacted me soon after the Salon series was published, and I talked to him for well over two hours. He wanted to talk to me about my book, Camellio, and uh, he had military background uh and i talked to him for a long time and then it it, it came out later that uh he was outed in this <laughs> leak as being over the oath keepers but that's really weird why did this oath keeper guy contact me and want to talk to me about how much he liked my book camellio why what, what what's the, what's that all about <laughs> <laughs> and he actually went out of his way to uh get me booked on a radio show in germany and he said oh this will open up a whole new audience for you and he actually successfully did that and i appeared on this guy's radio show in germany not not his radio show but he knew the guy who ran the radio the radio show and i, I appeared on the show and uh and the last time he contacted me was via email about a few days after january 6. Uh, and then and then that information dump happened and his wife divorced him, <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and there was a whole news story about it on uh, Fox Television. Uh, and I and I thought uh, that's really weird. You know why why was this guy contacting me? Um, uh, so so you have a lot of these uh, QAnon people who are basically uh, covert QAnon people. I mean that's why you don't hear a lot of people talking about it uh, openly anymore. Uh, o Omar Navarro, who's running for office, he's a politician in my hometown of Torrance, California. He, uh, and by the way, he recently came out of jail in San Francisco for stalking his, his ex-girlfriend, also a QAnon candidate uh, who ran against Nancy Pelosi. So at one point they were the QAnon like power couple. Uh, and then, and then, and then he went to jail and now he's out of jail and he's, he's trying to unseat Maxine Waters there was an interview with him in the New York Times and uh, they asked him about QAnon and he said, oh, I don't really talk about that anymore. I'm not stupid, <laughs> he, you know, but then, but then he proceeded to to voice all these like QAnon kind of things, you know, uh, but just wasn't mentioning Q anymore. So that's kind of like what I said in the book that in the future, it'll be like Q without Q, uh, you know, they're, they're going to kind of rebrand and, uh, I, I I noticed, you know, YouTube and and all these social media platforms were pulling QAnon content, and and I understand why they did that, but 
I was monitoring a lot of the 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 QAnon QTubers, and I, I can I can tell you <laughs> definitely <laughs> that that sort of censorious stratagem completely backfired, and if anything, made January 6th even worse. I mean, doing that just convinced them, oh, Q is right. You know, this is absolute proof that the, the establishment's coming down on us. That's because Q's telling the truth. Uh, and so I think a lot of people went to Washington, D.C. on January 6th who would not otherwise have done so because they were so pissed off <laughs> at the attempts to censor all of the QAnon uh, content. So, uh, uh, I, it, it seems to me that uh, historically, any attempt to slam the boot down on an idea usually makes the idea stronger because people love martyrs, and Christian evangelicals particularly love martyrs. Yeah. Well, uh, 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 I, uh, we we, we got to end, Jason. I know. <laughs> yeah. I know. <laughs> I'd love to keep going, but we got to wrap her up. Uh, uh, this is just, uh, a minor footnote of the the martyrdom is that. Um, Another great podcast, the Secret History of Western Esoteric podcast, mentions that uh, that there's actually more documented evidence of Christians talking about being martyred than there is of Christians being martyred historically. Um, <laughs> well, I, I, I was I attended one of Billy Graham's last public appearances at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena in I think 2003, um, or maybe it was 2004. And uh, there was a wonderful, it was really weird being surrounded by thousands of the God Squad at the Rose Bowl. And Billy Graham comes up and his head is magnified to gigantic proportions on the screen behind him. And uh, there was one lone guy who looked like, you know those cartoons where you see the bearded guy in the robe and the sign that says the end is nigh? Uh, <laughs> it looked exactly like that. One of those guys, he had a sign and it said like, Billy Graham is Satan. Uh, and he went to the front of the crowd and he starts screaming at Billy Graham. And for a second, Billy Graham, you could, his face is magnified to, to, to the size of Mount Rushmore on the screen. And you saw him get confused and a little nervous. And, uh, and then suddenly the security guards came out and grabbed the dude with the, with the wooden sign that said Billy Graham is Satan and kind of like dragged him away as the guy was yelling at Billy Graham. And, and Billy Graham says, see? They're still persecuting us. It's just like the Romans. Uh, and, and everyone in the audience was like, yeah. Uh, and and they it was it was it was shocking because here they are, like 2004, and and they're still in the mindset that they're the ones being persecuted. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And especially it's in 2004, it. really the, the height of evangelical power. Robert, uh, where can people find you online? Uh, I have a website. Cryptoscatology.com, which is a word I made up. Crypto, Latin for secrets. Scatology, the study of shit. So you put put it together, the study of secret shit, and that's that's what I do. Uh, so <laughs> Cryptoscatology was the title of my first book. So Cryptoscatology.com, uh, Operation Mindfuck, the various books I've mentioned, Until the Last Dog Dies, Camellio, uh, they, they're all available on Amazon. And if you don't want to deal with an evil corporation, you can go to orbooks.com, orbooks.com. They're the publisher of both Operation Mindfuck and Camellio, and you could order it from them. But yeah, all my books are, are on Amazon. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Uh, we'll definitely link those up for uh, everybody. So go down to the show notes uh, if you miss those links and buy all of Robert's books. And we are hoping that Robert will, will come back on and talk to us about some of the issues we're talking about today, as well as uh, some of his uh, more specific articles about Gnosticism. Uh, Jason, uh, do you have any plugs? Yeah, um, jasonmemmel.com is, is the easiest way to find me um, generally. And uh, specifically because we talked about Alan Moore's uh, Brought to Light, there's a, um, I did a podcast uh, uh, about politics and comics called Change Agents, and we did an episode on Brought to Light. Uh, so so that's, uh, that's something to mention. Also, just if people are Googling, you may be able to find out there an audio recording of Alan Moore himself performing as the the bald eagle uh, CIA salesman, um, and it's it's a delight. Um, yeah, oh, amazing! Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll have to we'll have to track that down and uh, send me the links to that podcast so, so I can link it up so everybody can check it out. 
Uh, for me, mileendmeditation.substack.com. That's a uh, mile uh, end meditation.substack.com. Some people who listen to it as, as a podcast have, have asked me to uh, clarify that. Uh, the free secular meditation Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Montreal time, Eastern Standard Time. It's uh, meditation for everybody. Uh, so come on out for that. That's absolutely free. And as I said, it's a, a secular mindfulness. So no matter what your background or your beliefs, there's a good chance you can get something out of it. If you're in Montreal, holygrail.substack.com is a newsletter for my parish so uh, it's part of the Gnostic and Mystical Joanite tradition you can come and check that out if you're in the Montreal area we're sponsored by the Joanite Church a mystic and Gnostic church if you want to know more about them if you want to know about whatever the Joanite tradition is about Joanite mysticism and Gnosticism I say go to joanite.org slash learn they've got a, a great free course on the history of Joanite Christianity uh, of Joanite Gnosticism of Joanite mysticism so uh, treat yourself. It's a free course. And that's it for all. now. Goodbye, everybody. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye.